So, I mean, there are a lot of things coming together right now. Uh, obviously, we have this upcoming election where there is an opportunity for, you know, monumental progress on climate. If people come out, if climate voters come out, they vote, vote on the issue of climate, the top of the ticket all the way down, then I think there's some real opportunity uh, for, for meaningful policy progress. You've got multiple climate plans on the table, sort of AOC version of the Green New Deal. House Democrats have a climate plan. Joe Biden has a climate plan. And these are pretty bold plans. And, you know, we'll have to figure how it all fits together. So I'm pretty optimistic that despite, you know, uh, a lot of the challenges, you know, we currently have under this administration, under Trump, um, there will be an opportunity for, for meaningful progress if people turn out, if people vote on this issue. Um, and that's so critical. You know, nothing is more important than this um, upcoming uh, election. And when I say uh, the election, I don't just mean the president. I mean, all the way down state and local offices, we need to see action from the local level all the way to the national level. And people have to vote on the climate issue uh, from, from president all the way down to dog catcher. And if we don't come out, then you know we, we know that the fossil fuel interests can turn out their vote. And we saw the, the implications of that. We saw the result of that in, in the last election in the last presidential election and four years of Trump. The, the first hundred days, you know, they should get rid of uh, fossil fuel subsidies. And we've seen a little bit of waffling there uh, with the DNC recently, but, you know, the, uh, the Biden campaign has uh, reaffirmed their commitment to get rid of su uh, subsidies. And so that's something that we can do immediately. Um, we need to, you know, we have a climate plan that's on the table. Uh, we need to actually pass one, and we need to be able to do it not just in the House but in the Senate. And if we, you know, if if the Democrats get back the Senate, then my sense is that we might need a few crossover Republican votes. And I do think that there are at least a half dozen or so Republicans who are in play, moderate Republicans, who who would vote for m meaningful, uh, you know, uh, climate action, and to you know move forward with some executive actions that Biden can, you know, move forward with immediately to stop the hemorrhaging that's been happening under the Trump administration, where they have been, you know, dismantling uh, environmental policies that uh, were established over a half century, even by prior Republican administrations. And so we need to reverse that, uh, make sure that the clean uh, power plan is being implemented, make sure that uh, we, we stop relaxing methane leakage restrictions, um, which, you know, were put in place again in the previous administration. Um, so cr cracking down on, you know, and corporate polluters who are evading basically the law right now because there's no real enforcement under the Trump administration. Um, so there's a lot of work to, to a lot of rebuilding. Unfortunately, a lot of damage has been done over a short period of time, and we're going to need to rebuild the infrastructure. We're going to need to get real scientists back into these, you know, into these agencies um, to restore the EPA to its rightful role, um, to restore science um, and science-driven policy in the EPA. There's just been so much destruction and erosion that, you know, frankly, the first year or two, I think, are going to be spent just rebuilding what we had. I mean, literally, Trump has reversed Nixon era environmental policies, if you can believe it. So, um, you know, what else is happening? You know, we're seeing industry uh, reined in to some extent. The coronavirus, I think we all now know friends and family members who have been impacted from this uh, terrible pandemic. The crisis ironically, has really negatively impacted the fossil fuel industry. And just yesterday, uh, you may have read this headline, ExxonMobil is now out of the Dow industrial average for the first time. And it's it's remarkable. And their, their profits have plummeted. Some of that is, is due to COVID-19, but I think some of that is structural. I think some of that is the fact that we're making real progress in transitioning to renewables. We just need to accelerate that, that transition. But if there's sort of a, a silver lining of sorts, it's that it's sort of opened our eyes to the, the precarious nature of our existence on this planet and basic issues of resilience and sustainability. We're starting to ask some of those questions because we've seen how dramatically our lives can be impacted by something that's microscopic. And, you know, and, and, and greenhouse gases, CO2 is invisible as well, you know, but we understand uh, how negatively it's impacting our lives. And I, I think COVID-19, to some extent, 
maybe sort of helps open up that conversation. Uh, in terms of the direct impact it's going to have on climate, as you allude to, unfortunately, it'll be modest in the end. By the time 2020 is over, and we'd all like to see 2020 end at this point, um, by the time 2020 is over, we will have seen only maybe a four to 5% decrease in carbon emissions. Now, that's great in the sense that we're finally going down the curve. We've reached the peak. We're coming off the other side of that peak. Here's the bad news. We've got to reduce carbon emissions by at least that amount every year for the next 10 years if we are to have any hope limiting warming below dangerous levels. Uh, and we're not going to be able to do that simply with you know changes in lifestyle. We are going to need fundamental systemic change. And that's one of the lessons of COVID-19. Changes in personal behavior and lifestyle alone can help at the margins, but they're not going to get us the reductions we need. We need to decarbonize our world. We need to decarbonize our economy. We need to decarbonize society. And that means policies that incentivize a dramatic shift away from fossil fuels to renewable energy and all of the policies um, that will help us deal with climate change and other environmental threats. You know, I, I witnessed what you guys are going through right now. I witnessed firsthand during a sabbatical down in Sydney um, late last year, early this year. Uh, I was there for the, the epic bushfires. Um, I, I watched that play out in real time. I was a few hundred yards from the Pacific and I couldn't see the Pacific Ocean. It was so much smoke in the air. And, and that's what we're seeing in, in California now. Similar wildfires that have been, you know, it, it's not rocket science. You take extreme heat, extreme drought, you put them together, you get these sorts of um, massive wildfires like we're seeing play out, you know, writ large, Australia, Amazon to the Arctic, and, and right now the Western US, California, Colorado. Well, as I, as I put it um, in a tweet the other day, you know, the West is on fire and the Gulf Coast is in the line of fire. Um, you know, this is, this is the face of climate change. And yeah, we've seen two systems, uh, both of uh, which will have achieved hurricane status um, before they're, they're done. Uh, Mario is now dissipated and made landfall. Fortunately, it's just a, 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 a tropical storm and it's dissipated. Um, but we're much more concerned about Laura. Laura looks like it has the potential to intensify into a major landfalling hurricane striking somewhere along the Louisiana or Texas coast. And, you know, what is it going to take? Um, you know, Maria, which uh, unprecedented Cat 5 hurricane, which decimated Puerto Rico, they're still recovering from it. They're having difficulty dealing with COVID-19 in part because of the damage to their infrastructure that was done by this unprecedented storm, which speaks to sort of the threat multiplier that is climate change, how these, you know, the, 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 these crises uh, propagate and, and, and one crisis, you know, begets another. You know, Harvey was the worst flood event in U.S. history uh, when it made landfall on the Texas coast a, a few years ago. The second worst was Florence when it made landfall on the Carolina coast. Um, we're seeing this onslaught of unprecedented, destructive, um, flood-bearing storms that, you know, would not be happening. We would not be seeing this in the absence of, of human-caused climate change. We no longer have to be tentative about connecting the dots. Um, the, the science is there. This is, you know, uh, the, the impacts of climate change are no longer subtle. We're seeing them play out in real time. You know, certainly, I mean, uh, food supply is really, you know, a, a critical issue here as, you know, we are drying and heating up the continents, um, baking the breadbasket, you know, of the United States and extreme weather disasters um, that destroy crops. Um, look at what happened in Iowa this summer and interrupt entire supply chains. Because we're a global world now, you have an extreme weather disaster in one part of the world, it's going to disrupt food supplies for the entire planet. And, and we've seen that in recent years. And so we're seeing drier summers, uh, we're seeing hotter summers. Um, that's a problem. One of the clearest predictions that we see playing out, unfortunately, is a decrease in agricultural productivity. Uh, part of it just comes from the heat. Cereal crops, they've evolved to their peak productivity 
in sort of the temperature range that we see today. And as you move temperatures, what you start to see in that productivity curve, you come down the other side of that curve precipitously. And so you see a huge decrease, especially in the tropics, where they have far greater challenges when it comes to, to feeding people. And they're likely to be hit the hardest. And we're heating up the oceans. We're acidifying the oceans. Uh, warmer oceans hold less oxygen. So there's less oxygen to support that food chain. Fish populations are threatened by multiple human impacts, overfishing, but climate change as well. And so it's sort of a perfect storm. You've got 7.8 billion and growing people on a finite planet with limited land, food, and water, and climate change. That's a prescription for you know, a, a, a post-apocalyptic future if we don't act. Antarctica, we know, is sort of, we're, we're starting to lose ice, um, you know, faster than we, you know, this is a recurring theme, faster than we had predicted uh, originally. Um, and, and that means sea levels are now rising faster than we had expected at this point. And there's some worry that much additional warming, we could really set in motion the disintegration of most of the West Antarctic ice sheet. Um, enough ice to give us, you know, tens of feet of sea level rise. Um, so that's problematic. Uh, at the same time, there's another major continental ice sheet up here in the Northern Hemisphere, Greenland. And there was just uh, a study published uh, about a week ago, actually, demonstrating that there is more destabilization uh, of the Greenland ice sheet than we expected at this point. Now, there were some incorrect headlines that claimed that the study showed that we had gone beyond the point of no return and we're going to lose all of Greenland. Uh, <laughs> fortunately, that's not true. Uh, I, you know, as soon as I saw that study, I, I read it and said, you know, the study doesn't actually support the headlines that we're reading. It was a very bad press release that was put out. Um, my colleague here at Penn State, uh, Richard Alley, is one of the world's leading ice sheet specialists. And, and I talked to him and got a statement from him that put it in context. And what the study shows is we're further along than we expected to be, and that's bad. And with much additional warming, we could you know, go past that tipping point where we do guarantee the destruction of the Greenland ice sheet. But by all accounts, we're not there yet. And so there are reasons for cautious optimism here that we can still prevent the worst impacts of climate change. But we need dramatic action. You know, there are two words uh, these days uh, in my vocabulary when I try to summarize where we are. It's urgency and agency. There is great urgency, but there's also agency. We know what to do. It's just a matter of getting, you know, doing it.